Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to start off with Ward. He's going to give a little talk about uh, a subject that is a little more dense, and it, but it's going to be important for what we're going to be studying from this point forward. So it's all yours, Ward. Okay, um, because we're just about to get into uh, Prana Nakash now, um, I wanted to give a very quick introduction to the idea of thinking the imagination from infinite intelligence. Some of you who have studied infinite intelligence will be you know, acquainted with it. Uh, but I think somebody already, uh, why am I not getting my, yeah, can you see? I'm not getting my proper view, but, um, huh. oh, are you getting it? No. No. There you go. No, no you are. There I you just go. thought somebody read this. Who read this the other day? <laughs> I did. I just yeah. thought you did. It's such a yeah. great quote. From, yeah. I just I happened to see it. This is Al Ghazali, one of the towering geniuses of Islam. The farthest limit achieved by human reason through the principles of the illumination of his sublimity is bewilderment. Isn't that great? So principles of the illumination of sublimity. This is like the mind's illumination of the sublimity of God by studying or reading the Quran or, you know, meditating on these subjects. Um, so the highest, the furthest limit you can achieve is bewilderment. So if you're feeling bewildered, well, that's pretty good, huh? Means you've reached the farthest limit. We're on our way. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the reason why I wanted to, uh, okay, um, talk about thinking the imagination uh, is that Pran and Akash belong to the domain of the imagination. Infinite Intelligence talks about Pran and Akash and says that very explicitly. I know we haven't really gotten into Prana and Akash yet. But this here, so this slide shows the fundamental dichotomy in infinite intelligence, the dichotomy of thinking and imagination. And um, thinking does not mean what you might think it means. Uh, it's not an ordinary use of the word thinking. What it means is consciously realizing. And uh, the uh, aspect of thinking is rooted in the self or the atman so thinking is the consciousness coming from the real from the reality uh, the reality uh, which is inherent in every drop soul every one of us we're in the language of infinite intelligence we are thinkings that he uses that word so is a stone so is a frog, so is a swan. Every jivatma is a thinking. And the reality of that thinking is the atma, which is God. It's the paramatma. In other words, every jivatma is at its root, a drop that is the ocean. It is the reality, right? So that's Baba's metaphysics. But what we do when we experience the world is we think the imagination. Now, what the imagination is, is um, nothing produced as infinite nothingness. That's the language of God speaks. Um, the entire universe is actually nothing at all. But through the activity of Ishwar, who's creator, preserver, destroyer, Ishwar is a major figure in infinite intelligence. The imagination is created as the infinite creation. It does not exist. It's completely imaginary. Whereas the thinking does exist. The thinking is at its root, the Atma or the self, right? So this left-hand side of the... Uh, uh, this diagram, the thinking, this is the real, and the imagination is the completely imaginary. Now, imagination, so it's created and preserved and destroyed by Ishwar, 
that aspect of God, the third state of God. Um, the imagination is not false. Baba uses the word false in a very specific way. What is false is when the thinking thinks the imagination. Now, to think the imagination, we're all doing it at this instant. That's when I, as a thinking, as a atma, uh, look at the imagination and say, this is me. Like I identify with my body, I say, this body is me. And through the medium of the body, I experience the environment or the universe, subject and object. The subject is what I identify with. And through that identification, I experience the imaginary universe. That is thinking the imagination, right? So that is what every drop soul does. Uh, as long as it is bound to the sense scares that cause us to do it. So like uh, uh, when Elizabeth is uh, uh, thinking she's in a room and has her chin on her hand and uh, has a light on in the background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all false thinking because it is attributing reality to the imagination. When in fact, imagination belongs exclusively to the thinking itself. I hope that this is making sense. So here's another expanded diagram. So you see the basic split. The thinking, all these thinkings are real, uh, whereas the imagination is completely imaginary. Um, and uh, so finite false thinking, that would be like in evolution, when you think finitely, when you're only finitely conscious, like a stone is only a little bit conscious, an ant is more conscious, you know, a uh, bear is more conscious. Infinite false thinking is us human beings because we actually have infinite consciousness. It, the, the problem does not lie in the consciousness, the problem lies in what we're conscious of. We're thinking the imagination instead of thinking uh, a self or thinking God. Uh, but the thinking itself is, un is infinite. Infinite real thinking would be a Majub or a perfect master or Baba who has infinite thinking and is conscious of himself as himself. So you see the whole thinking side of this is uh, rooted in reality, whereas the imagination has this basic split creating it, pran and akash, uh, which we're going to get into today. This is the primordial dichotomy, pran and akash. So that's what uh, creation as causes is really going to uh, tell us a lot about. Now, creation as causes does not explain that pran and akash comprise the imagination or this distinction between thinking the imagination or any of that. None of that was explained to the boys. So I'm just providing that as kind of a global context. Here are some more, uh, okay. Okay, here's a, a metaphor of it that you'll find in Infinite Intelligence. Um, Jamshed's eye. Here, ja the... Uh, State B, if you can see, is my little arrow showing up for you guys? No? I could get a laser pointer. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, I see it. I can see it as long as you okay. move Okay, you there can you see it? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. That's better. Okay. Um, in this state, this is the state of Ishwar, creator, preserver, destroyer. And Jamshed in the Ishwar state creates the this the entire universe, this shadowy jump shed on the right is the universe, the gross, subtle, and mental sphere. Now, one of the things that infinite intelligence um, reveals to us that we wouldn't have known is that the entire creation is created all at once. It's not created progressively. It's created all at once by Ishwar. Um, but what is done progressively is realizing, now we get down to uh, the lower left-hand pa panel, where 
now Jamshed identifies with the form. Here it's an atom. On the right hand side, it's a stone. And through that small ident small opening, see it's a small mirror. We show it a growing mirror, he experiences a small bit of the created universe. So only what's within the frame of that mirror there uh, is experienced by Jamshed when he identifies with an atom. When he identifies with a stone, the mirror is somewhat bigger, so he can experience more of it. Here it's like a lotus, and uh, because the lotus form is larger and more expanded, he can experience more of the imagination. Here as a monkey, uh, he's experiencing most of it. And here, state D, as a human being, he experiences it completely. So he realizes the imagination infinitely. So this is infinite false thinking. Why is it false? because he is attributing his own reality to the imagination. But the imagination is not real. What is real is Jamshed, but he's not looking at himself, he's looking at the imagination. So this is thinking the imagination infinitely. But in the last panel, the imagination is annihilated and destroyed. And here you see a rather complacent Jamshed who now thinks himself. He is having the I am God experience. So creating is what gets created, preserved, and destroyed in panel B is the imagination. And thinking or realizing is the realization, realizing in the sense of making real or investing reality in realizing in that sense. So Jamshed is investing parts of his own reality in the imagination. That is false thinking because he's not the imagination, he's himself. The imagination is not false. What is false is the believing that it is real. So that's a quick, very quick um, introduction to the idea thinking the imagination. Let's see if there are any other slides. I mean, okay, I'll just, uh, this is from God Speaks. And this is actually expressing the same idea, the top panel. Man is gross conscious through his gross body of the gross sphere. He, through, he is thinking the imagination, the gross sphere, through the medium of his gross body. God Speaks does not use the language of thinking the imagination, but that's what it's really about. So, uh, and this actually expresses the idea of thinking the imagination also. Okay, this is a huge topic, and we could spend a long, long time on it. Uh, but I just wanted to give a very quick um, mention, because as I say, Infinite intelligence does not develop this much, but now we're going to find a, in fact, as I say, creation as causes doesn't use the word imagination and doesn't talk about thinking and imagination or realizing or any of this. That's all from Baba's dictation in 19, to the Mandali in 1926. But he makes it very explicit there that Pran and Akash belong to the domain of the imagination. In fact, there, you might say they're what open up and develop and project the imagination, this division between Prana and Akash. So anyway, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. It's a very, very quick presentation of a huge, huge topic. Okay, thank you, Ward. Um, I don't know, do you wanna take a few questions about it or should we just get into the reading? Well, maybe we could do maybe five minutes worth. I don't wouldn't five want minutes to try to questions, get no comments. Yeah. Yeah. Questions, yeah. The questions that you need for some clarity. And please yeah. uh, we need to be brief. We're, we're getting short on time. So yeah. um let me restore your ability to unmute yourselves. Raise your hands, please. 
if you have something you want to say. And we have Elizabeth. Thank you. I, I actually put mine in the chat too. Um, so I want to understand if I got this right. The imagination itself is not false, but thinking that it is real is that which is false. Did I get that right? right? That's right. Okay. And the uh, imagination the is not false. The imagination does not exist. It's nothing. It's nothing which Ishwar manifests as infinite uh, creation, but it doesn't exist at all. So falsehood, as you say, comes in when a jivatma, like you or me, looks at it and, and believes it, takes it to be real. That's false thinking. But uh, the creation itself is not false. Uh, but this is important because Ishwar traffics in creating, preserving, destroying the imagination. Um, and Ishwar never looks back and says, I am God. Ishwar does not have the I am God experience. But from our point of view, Ishwar is indifferentiable from God. Um, but Baba never attributes falseness to Ishwar because Ishwar never realizes the imagination. We do that. We realize that, you see the word real, realize is actually a good English word because the implication here is takes to be real. And in fact, when we, you or I, when we realize the universe by experiencing the room we're in, for example, we're investing in our body and in the space we're in we're attributing it to it, a reality that actually is us. The one who's real is my real self, not the room, not my body. So we're a trip. When we realize the imagination, you're investing your own reality in something that is imaginary. It's a very beautiful and deep idea, actually. Well, I don't see any other uh, hands. That was that was helpful, Elizabeth. Thank you for your question. That was clarifying. Yeah. And um, let's go ahead and get started. Do you think? Yep. Okay. Ready now? All right. So our first reader today, you can take the share then, Ward, and bring up the book. Yeah. Let's see. Our first reader will be Melissa, followed by Alan. Okay, let me see. Uh, are you getting a blank screen? Let me move yeah. in where it's no longer blank. I see a white, white page there. There it we is. Got creation. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Well, let's move ahead to where we were. By the way, did uh, I don't know if everybody was uh, on when we talked about this, but. Um, uh, they started printing the book yesterday. So that's a <laughs> big deal. I will go over there every day and cheer them on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of exciting when you're, you know, in the printing business. It's really an exciting moment when you start to actually print a book. Mm. Okay. So we're on this one. And yeah. We've reached here. Yeah. yeah. We just finished this section. Okay. So we're in the middle of this lecture. And um, here is the figure. This is a rather mysterious one. Um, but uh, you know, God in the ocean, you've seen that before. That's where everything comes out of. And here's the creator point. That's the place of creator, preserver, destroyer. Uh, the third state of God in God Speaks, or Ishwar in Infinite Intelligence. And this is probably um, Akash, or Pokal, or the vast emptiness. And what these are, we just don't know, although we can maybe guess. So uh, maybe somebody could read this. Uh, it's right at the very start of this whole section. Do we have a reader? Go ahead, Melissa. You have to unmute. 
Are you there, Melissa? Did we lose you? Let's check. All right, Alan, why don't you go ahead and start and I'll find Melissa. She must have dropped off. Alan, are you okay to go? Key to figure nine. Figure nine is based on perhaps the most mysterious and in enigmatic of all the original diagrams in the explanations manuscript. In both sources, diagrams appear at a moment when Baba has been characterizing the world as a hollow bubble, which somehow serves as the site of the clash between movement and emptiness, pran and akash. In figure nine, A designates God as the ocean and B must be the Om point. Presumably, a large circle beneath B represents the created universe as emptiness and nothingness, as we saw in figure seven. The significance of the descending vertical line with dots along it remains altogether unexplained. Perhaps this represents the journey of the individual jivatma with periodic stepping stones of individual lifetimes through a world of emptiness. But this is nothing better than a guess. Since the meaning of the source figure remains so elusive, the artist editorial team has produced in figure nine that original diagram with little alteration or development. Right, so uh, here it is, here's the figure. Even though Nadia and I don't know what it means, we both like this figure. <laughs> it's, it's neat somehow. But maybe one of you will be able to resolve it. Okay. Do you want to keep going, Alan? Can you see it okay? Yes. Uh, but you dropped a line. Could you lower it just? A, yeah. Um, oh, I see. All right. That's the end of the previous section. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But now we come to another question. How is evolution itself created? We have seen that the world is a bubble, and as such, it is empty, hollow, pokal. And uh, it might be worth reading this note. This is an important word. This Gujarati adjective, meaning hollow or empty or excavated, is used by Baba to refer to what he elsewhere calls Akash, as he explains in this series of lectures and in other places. The primordial separation of Pran and Akash and their subsequent clashing is what gave rise to the created universe. Yet while Akash serves as a general designation for space, the connotation of hollowness carried by the word pokal is especially apt in connection with Baba's metaphor of the bubble. Okay, so that's a big word, pokal. Uh, I can't pronounce it properly, but that L with a dot under it is arla, arla, pokal. It's a, a retroflex. You flap the tongue on the roof of the <laughs> mouth. No one will be able to say that, but. Indeed, not only is this our own world, but everything below point B, the creator point in figure nine, is a bubble, a shadow. Pokala. Paramatma, or the ocean, Dar Darya, is above the line. When Darya begins to move at this very moment, this very movement gives a push to and actually clashes with the hollow emptiness of the pokala. How, the, how does this uh, clash come about? It is created by the coming into contact and the striking together of the two. That is the movement with the pokala, pokalsath movement, gasha, Gasai -che. Gasai -che. This clash 
the striking together of the movement with the hollowness and emptiness creates lightning or vis. To understand this process clearly, remember and keep it in mind that movement equals energy equals universal pran. Vacant open space equals emptiness or hollowness, which equals akash. Alan, can you just slow down a little bit and start that paragraph again? Hmm. To understand this process clearly, remember and keep it in mind that movement is equal to energy, is equal to universal pran. Vacant open space is equal to emptiness or hollowness which is equal to Akash. Now, one of the results of the lightning thus created by the contact made or the clashing between the movement and the emptiness or Pokal is now designated by scientists as the electron. Okay, let me expand this for you. So we this, could. This looks like uh, the first embodiment. Um, in God Speaks, the fourth state of God is the embodied soul. So it looks like this is where the evolutionary C series begins. Sorry. So we could equate lightning with the electron. Remember that even in the electron, the drop is already present. The drop, as we noted earlier, is of the ocean, and indeed actually is the ocean itself, but in a limited form. Remember, too, that in every bubble, whether wave bubble or drop bubble, the drop abides, or indeed innumerable, innumerable drops do so in the case of a wave bubble. The electron created by the clash is the first bubble, that is, the beginning of the growth. And in that first drop bubble, that is the electron, Atma abides. For the drop or bubble is the element of limitation connected with the great unlimited Atma. The present advanced science of the world has progressed to this point, the creation of the electron. Beyond that point, this gross world science does not and cannot go, for there is one, for there one reaches the boundary of the subtle into which one cannot penetrate with gross means. But now, where and what is this emptiness, Pokal? This much we can say, that the world is Pokal, empty. As Hafez says, Jawan o kare jahan jamle hikdar hikas. The world of- Jahan jahan o kare jahan jamle hich dar hichas. Thank you. Mm. Oh, say it again, please. It's so beautiful, yeah. Jahan o kare jahan jomle hich dar hichas. This means mm. the world and its working or what it does is nothing in nothing. <laughs> in fact, maybe uh, you could re uh, start reading from the footnote that gives the whole couplet. You see down at the bottom there. The complete couplet reads Jahal <laughs> Jah Maho, Maho, do you want to give a whirl yes. on this one? Jahanu kare jahan jomle hich dar hich hast hezar bar man in nukte karde am tahqiq hezar bar man in nukte karde am tahqiq and then it says what it means that is, the world and its affairs, in summary, are nothing into nothing. 
A thousand times have I researched this point. Yeah, we can skip the references there. Let us formulate a theoretical proof. We say that God is everything and God is everywhere. Therefore, there is nothing but God, which is to say that nothing is there. Nothing panche pokal bihiche, just as nothing is pokal, is also. So we see that out of the nothing, all this pasara gotala, all this spread of confusion emerges. Even this nothing is God, for God is. in nothing too. We conclude, therefore, that everything is nothing, and in nothing there is everything. Now God is the everything, and the universe is nothing. So if anything is real, God is real, and the path too, which is to say everything from top to bottom in a straight line, from God unconscious on the bottom through the planes to God conscious. Ishvar Anemarg Sivyanu Badhu Jekotru, apart from Ishwar and the path, all else is false a Gujarati phrase translated literally in the text. And let's uh, jump over to the next page and then come back to the key here. Uh, this is the end of the lecture. So uh, th uh, this is illustrating what he... At first we were puzzled why this figure was here, but he's just said, apart from God in the path, nothing is real. So here you have... Um, God unconscious, the path, and God conscious. Well, the entire, you know, gross sphere, the evolutionary journey, all the kingdoms of evolution are skipped. So it seems to be illustrating that idea. Ishvar ane marg sevainu vaduj kotu. Apart from Ishwar and the path, all else is false. So going back to the... Or yeah. can, can we pause here for a moment? I think people are yeah. getting a little right, overwhelmed. I was... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, yeah. do you want to read that last page again, Alan? That could be a good idea. Yeah. It's so this is very dense, as you guys can see. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're recording it, I know, but we want to at least absorb a little bit of it from this, from our time. Where should we start from? Want to... The page before that at the bottom. Okay, this was the last page we did, and this is the page before. Where okay, do you yeah. Think? Yeah, so the pr the present advanced science of the world. What, yeah. Start, it's good enough. I, yeah. I think, agree. that'd be a good idea. The present advanced science of the world has progressed to this point, the creation of the electron. Beyond that point, this gross world science does not and cannot go, for there one reaches the boundary of the subtle, into which one cannot penetrate with gross means. But now, where and what is this emptiness, this pokal? This much we can say, that the world is pokal, empty. As Hafiz says, Johan o kare Johan jomle hich dar hich ast. The world and all its workings is nothing into nothing. Let us formulate a theoretical proof. We say that God is everything and God is everywhere. Therefore, there is nothing but God, which is to say that nothing is there. 
Nothing. Right. Do you guys, do you guys get? He's doing kind of a wordplay. There is nothing but God. In other words, nothing is part of the picture. There is nothing but God. <laughs> but nothing is there as nothing. <laughs> He's trying to explain the relationship between the everything and the nothing. Can nothing. You say that again, word, please. The relationship. Yeah. Where he says, God is everything and God is everywhere. Right? Well, that makes sense. So you could say, there is nothing but God. God is everything. There is nothing but God. But when you say there is nothing but God, you are saying that there is nothing. But it's nothing. It doesn't exist, but it exists as nothing. <laughs> this is central to Baba's metaphysics of the everything and the nothing. The nothing is a necessary adjunct to the everything, but it doesn't exist. It's not real at all. Nothing. <laughs> Pan Che. Pa, uh, Ward, a little help, please. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing, Pan Che, Pokal Biche. By the way, Che means is. Um, so, nothing, Pan Che, Pokal Biche. And then that gets translated in what follows. Just as nothing is, Pokal is also. You get that pokal is the word for emptiness or nothing. So we see out of this nothing, all this pansara gotala, all this spread of confusion emerges. Yet even this nothing is God, for God is in nothing too. We conclude, therefore, that everything is nothing, and in nothing there is everything. Now, God is the everything, and the universe is nothing. So if anything is real, God is real. And the path, too, which is to say, everything from the top to bottom in a straight line, from God unconscious on the bottom, through the plains, to God conscious. Ishvar Anemarg Siviam Nu Budhu Je Kotur Apart from Ishvar and the path, all else is false. So you can see that this diagram sort of shows that. Because all else is left out of the diagram. <laughs> Ishwar would be, sometimes he'll use Ishwar to refer to God, but if it's creator, preserver, destroyer, Ishwar would be located at the own point there. And so he's, attri he's attributing reality to the path. He doesn't mean that it's truly, absolutely real, but it's, the, it's more real. And he's talking, he's, he's talking to these boys. He's a kind of uh, saying, hey, kids, get on the path. Yeah. Can, can you can show that hands? footnote on the previous page? Uh, the second footnote on the... Yeah, we didn't see what that was. Is that the, the one you're talking there? about, Alan? No, on the previous page to that. Yeah, this is where that, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sara, yeah, this is that phrase, um, pasara gotala. Pasara means spread or pervasion, and gotala means confusion. So all this pasara gotala, all this, in other words, the world, the creation, it's a spread of confusion because it doesn't exist. This was a Gujarati phrase that Baba liked. So it's a big blooming confusion, just as yeah. Ryan yeah. Said. Okay. Did we read this? I yeah. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Um, let's have uh, Melissa. Are you ready to read? I thought she was back. Yes, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, sorry, my modem was down for a while. 
Um, key to figure 10. Appearing suddenly at the end of the 7th of December lecture, figure 10 diverts from the creation narrative that has dominated until now and instead shows the seven planes within the greater frame of the soul's journey from God unconscious before the creation to God conscious at the summit of realization. Though this entire greater movement from God unconscious to God conscious is the story of the divine theme, figure 10 does not depict the stages of creation, evolution, or reincarnation, but involution and realization only. This comports with Baba's exhortation at the end of the lecture, where he tells the boys that nothing matters except God and the path to him. You know, we're going to see this kind of pattern in um, this series of lectures. When Baba gets to reincarnation, he basically skips the subject. He says very little about it. And uh, my understanding of this is he, th these boys, he was leading them right into the experience of the path. So he wasn't going to talk about subjects like this. That would be for adults. He was going to love God, create love, and experience the path to God. So he consistently skips those kinds of topics. Okay, so that's the end of that one. So you can see we're really into the uh, thick of it. So that's the first presentation of Prana Nakash. We're going to get more on it. Uh, I have a suggestion before hmm. we take questions. Why don't you go back to the first page of today, just letting people... Yeah. Refresh their memories mm -hmm. and see if they have a question mm -hmm. about that. Just yeah. highlight that section, see if anybody has a question about that page first. Yeah. So there's the diagram yeah. that comes. And uh, this talks about how everything beneath the creator point is all a hollow, focal emptiness. And when Darya, that's a good word to get to know. It's the word for ocean. When ocean begins to move, at this very moment, this very movement gives a push to and actually clashes with the hollow emptiness, the pokal. That's the meeting and clashing of prana and akash. Pokal and akash are synonyms. Jim, did you have a question or comment? Yes. <clears throat> it seems that Pran and Akash, although they were created, were pre prerequisites for creation. Yeah. No, I agree. They had, they had to be there in order for creation to take place. Is it? You, you need the movement, the energy, and all the, the space. Is that yeah. correct? Am I, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's true. So we're actually getting a, a creation narrative here. You don't get this in God Speaks. God Speaks, I mean, I, we could talk a lot about that. Maybe at some point we could. Yeah, but Pran and Akash separate, and then they clash. This clash, the striking together of the movement with the hollowness or emptiness, creates lightning or vij. Let me just show you the uh, diagram that we did of this. Oh, wow. This, this mm. diagram here. My so favorite. you see here, this is knowledge and paramatma. That's God at the beginning. We haven't really gone to knowledge yet. Knowing our universal mind. And out of that, pran and akash separate. They meet and clash, producing lightning or vij. And we're going to find out later that the first thing to come out of that is the four elements, earth, air, water, fire, and the entire universe is produced from that. So this is the origination of uh, the universe or the created universe. 
this is the basic idea. Yeah. Now, this is kind of a aspect of this that kind of goes beyond understanding, but um, I mean, uh, I think a lot of times there are these uh, conundrums and when you try to understand it, it defeats the mind and that's very good for us, have the mind defeated. So here's the question, how does emptiness or hollowness clash with movement? Can you conceptualize that? Because I can't. They don't, how do they touch each other, you know? That was and one thing to, to speak, please raise your hands. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Anybody? Sorry, uh, Elizabeth has been waiting. Go ahead. Hmm. So I have one question and one comment. So regarding the movement, so in God Speaks, it says that the urge comes before the whim and the movement. So I just want to. So I'm wondering if the so so maybe this is related to the pre-knowing, all-knowing. But anyway, I just want to know the relationship between the urge and the movement, which leads to the clash. That was one. The comment was the figure nine to me looks like a baseball. And um, when I'm comparing that to figure 10, so that vertical line with the dots, if you go to figure 10, can you go to figure 10? So you can see the figure 10. Okay. Mm. So in the first one, those vertical lines with the dots are contained within limits, within a circle. In other places, Baba says, if you go to the opposite of the circle, it's a straight line and the opposites lead back to itself. They, they, uh, so there's the, the contrariety, um, the, the extreme opposite of one thing is the other thing. And he talks about that with good and evil. But if you look at the figure 10, it's without those boundaries in it. And um, what am I trying to say? That um, maybe it's a depiction of only the real part of that, mm -hmm. which is not constrained. So there are no boundaries in that one. And, and the conscious, the unconsciousness and the consciousness of God and the quote real seems to be what is the focus in there. Anyway, any comments on the urge whim and the other baseball limitation and the unlimited real? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, the urge and that whole theme. Um, let's take that up later. Um, you see, God speaks is giving a different creation narrative um, because what is the whim? The whim is who am I? But uh, this, ver this account does not mention that. There's no question who am I that gets brought up here. So uh, I'll just say what I think is that um, this is a, ver an, a creation narrative that focuses on the imagination um, the object of consciousness, which is the imagination, whereas the whim narrative is focused on the subject, the I, who am I, the real, the thinking rather than the imagination. Now, that may be too difficult to, but I'll just flip that out there for the moment. But you notice this is a different creation narrative than we get in God Speaks. God Speaks doesn't mention Prana and Akash explicitly, and this doesn't mention the original question, who am I? Lord, Never I brings that up. Hmm. Uh, would you say that the clash of Pran and Akash is the beginning of duality? Um, it's necessary for duality. I yeah, know, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. I mean, there's kind of the precondition that Prana and Akash have to 
separate from each other, but it's when they meet and clash. Here's what I would say that that is the uh, uh, emergence of the fourth state of God, the embodied soul, the mm -hmm. jivatma, the drop soul and sanskaras come into the picture at that instant when they clash. Mm -hmm. Because when you just have Prana and Akash separately, they belong to the imagination. There's nothing real there yet. The Jivatma, the soul, has not entered into the story. But when they meet and clash, then you get the drop soul that says, I am an electron. Mm -hmm. And the journey of the soul begins. Mm -hmm. Mahu. Thank you. Um Ward, I, I still like to uh, go back to this, uh, whatever we we're discussing for past probably five minutes. Um, I like to read uh, this part and then refer it to the figure and then get more explanation from you if you don't mind that way. Hopefully it stays with me. Um, it says, we have seen that the world is a bubble and as such, it is empty. Hollow poco. Indeed, not only this, our own world, but everything below point B. Okay, so up there, that the half circle is Daria Ocean, mm. right? Point A right. is God, mm -hmm. and then there's a creation point, and then mm -hmm. underneath is this bubble or hollowness or call. Um, however, uh, uh, Cassandra, or, or uh, I don't know who's showing, but can we go to the, the text, please? Word or, uh, I don't know, aha. Uh -huh. Then, um, okay, Pukal, okay. Paramatma, or the ocean, Darya, is above the line. When Darya begins to move at this very moment, this very movement gives a push to and actually clashes with the hollow emptiness, the cocoa. Uh, you did mention that uh, I'm mm. still trying to absorb this. There's a reason Baba is explaining yeah. all this. Um, you also mentioned, maybe I misunderstood just now that, um, that, uh, even point A is imagination. Point A and, and uh, B, they're both imagination. However... No, A, oh. A is the real. Oh, A God is real Dudia. then. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. A is God, so therefore it's mm. real. Um, so when, when it says when A is moving and yeah. then had that encounter with hollowness, uh, it creates the clash. Mm. Uh, is it, I mean, just, I know we don't want to go to God speaks, but is it, could it be a time where the unconscious God asks himself, who am I? And then he well, begins that to do narrative, something about it. That narrative will ultimately need to be uh, correlated with this one, no doubt about it. I mean, we're talking about the origination of creation. Yeah. Right. So that might be something for us to, at some point, delve into and uh, yeah. work out a little more. It'd be good for us to read more first, though. Yeah. But can notice you, that he doesn't please, mention that. Can you please uh, show that other figure when the clash happens and it is track the two together? Yeah. And it makes, does it make the poke hole to move at that point? So does movement well, I don't, impact poke hole? Poke hole doesn't move, but uh -huh. movement becomes associated with poke hole. I see. Okay. Associated with poke hole. Now here's, okay. a, this is part of what makes this topic uh, kind of beyond the mind is this. You know, if you think about the original state, before Prana and Akash separated. Baba gives the uh, metaphor of the infinite ocean, right? Right. And it's the best metaphor that I could conceive of giving, but it has this 
misleading implication. When I think of an infinite ocean, I think of this vast dark black ocean extending infinitely in every direction, right? Don't you think about something sort of like that? Yes. But that conception of it as space, the infinite ocean has no space. So <laughs> our basic idea of it is wrong. So, you know, when you, you're, if you're going to have movement um, uh, in the infinite ocean, how can that happen when there's no place for it to happen in, right? So what movement needs is an opening, a place, a stage. It needs a place to happen. And that's what the akash is. Akash is like capacity or potentiality. Akash provides a place where movement can move. So they have to actually clash and meet before you can have a creation. You get the idea? If there's no space, how can anything really move? It's yeah. just kind of imaginary movement. Yeah. And so they, they have to meet and clash, and then you can get realization of the creation. Then I you see. can get the jivatma. Hmm. So if you think of is a Is that where the matter, of course, Baba says there is no matter. Yeah, no, Baba associates matter with a kash, and he says right. that matter is essentially emptiness. It's mm -hmm. essentially nothing, which is different. And then Baba than says matter mm. is a byproduct of your thinking. When your mind is not there or when you're in sound sleep, there is no akash. Or in that uh, text, he says there is no matter. <laughs> yeah. We have, oh, some more, we have some more questions. That, you know, it's, it's yeah. hard Sorry. to get that deep into it. It just. But yeah. very good. Uh, yeah, thank very you good. so much, Roar. This Your explanation really mm. helps us. Thank you. Mm. Ellen, then Ellen. Uh, I just wanted to say that it seems to me that there's a, an inherent difficulty with the diagrams in that they imply that all of this happens outside of, of the ocean. Mm. And it, it, it can't happen outside the ocean. It, 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 it's a, right. That's why that's why the bubble, it's still all happening within the, with, well, with, within doesn't describe it either, but it cannot be outside the ocean, but you can't do a diagram without implying that it is outside the ocean. Just wanted That's to- completely right, yeah. And Baba makes that point very emphatically a number of times. Yeah. It's all within the ocean. There's no outside of the ocean. See, uh, this is where our dualistic mind really uh, can't uh, understand this really. But I think it's very good to try to understand it because trying to understand these things that are impossible to understand, it gives a real hammering to the mind and is very good for us. <laughs> That's what I think. It's Karen. like that Al-Ghazali quotation. It's, uh, uh, it's bewildering, which is great. <laughs> Karen, Karen, this, yes, thank you. Um, this is great. Oh, I should lower my hand. There. Um, yeah. I've always wondered in, a, in an atom, um, what was around the electrons and neutrons and the things that are dancing about in there. So this is right on where I've always, mm. always been curious. And oh, yeah. um, so when I think about movement, I think I I that it. I am there. Can, is there a comment? Do I need to do something? No, no it's, it's no. okay, no. keep going, yeah. Okay, yeah, in movement, I'm there. I'm here and then I'm there, you know, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm here and not there un, until time, in which case I'm then and not now. And so it, it um, creates time and space is what I'm thinking. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what you were just um, mentioning right. maybe. Mm. Um, and yeah. 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 I think that's so right. it's, it's movement is, is where time and space happens, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the other thing I had is I've always, um, 
had trouble with the ocean analogy because it, when I think of an infinite ocean, there's a sky above it. And I'm thinking, but right. what about the sky? You know, mm. but if I think about outer space, you know, and the planets mm. and beyond that, then mm. then I can kind of grasp that. So I think that ocean you're thinking of is maybe what I think of as outer space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's an image Baba has given us, and it's the best image and a useful image, but it has space in it, whereas the infinite ocean has no space. It's before space. So um, that's unimaginable. Uh, like a way of thinking of, uh, another way of thinking of movement or pran. You see, Baba's use of the word pran is a very deep one. It's not just like subtle energy. It contains that, but it's bigger than that. But you could say it's change, um, transformation. And um, you could say that Akash, I mean, I'm just being very interpretive here, is like possibility. Akash creates the space of possibility where change can happen. Change can't happen if there's no opening providing a space for chain for a movement to happen in, right? How can you move if there's no space, right? But movement does not contain space. So it has to clash with space. And then you can get a creation. Another way of describing prana and akash is they are the preconditions of creation. Okay, Jack has a question. More of a statement. My, uh, 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 to me, it's simple in the sense that that in, in figure nine, where you have the circle, is a for me, a description of existence as I know it. Uh, and it's empty, it's always empty until I, as an Kivatma, do something, exist. And in that existence, many things which are nothing into nothing occur. And that's why you have the Akashic record. That's what that is. It's a record of all of human thought and feeling and, and whatever of existence. Um, and bringing in what Baba had said, that he would take his lovers in a veil up, up the steps of subtle mental areas. So there's no need to to give the boys anything about that, you know, the the, the various steps. Okay. And, and and the electron, I, I remember another thing Baba said uh, that we I don't know, I'm paraphrasing here that we need to be wary of uh, blowing off atomic bombs because they have a tendency to penetrate into the subtle plane, which would tear apart the gross plane. Anyway, that's what I was thinking. Thanks, Jack. Um, um, is there any other questions people have about the text itself? Um, you, know, uh, I, you know, I've read uh, several books on, you know, quantum but you know yeah to really be knowledgeable <laughs> you have to spend years on it which i don't have um but my impression is that when you when science has tried to penetrate beyond the level of the quantum you get these it's not particles anymore it's just kind of these weird abstractions i forget what some of the names of them are um but it's almost like abstract principles. You don't, it's not particles anymore. You know, It'd be good I, to have somebody who really knew this, that subject. Yeah. But so Baba is really clearly saying that uh, evolution of consciousness begins with the electron. 
And you know, Ward, one of the things I like about these drawings is that we keep getting different points of view. And every time you get right. a slightly different points of view, point of view, mm. uh, it, it helps you to focus on another aspect of it. And yeah. then yeah, at yeah. some point they start to come together. But it's going to yeah. be a while for us before it all right, starts. Right, right. No, you're getting a blitzkrieg of stuff. Yeah. I hope this is all making sense, but isn't it amazing that Baba was giving this stuff to a bunch of kids? Unbelievable. And for us adults, we have to record it so we can go through it over and over and over again. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, you can see it. Like, it's just obvious to me. A simple paragraph like this one that we read, yeah. you could spend um, weeks meditating on this. You know, the bubble and... Uh, bubble shadow paramatma is above the line when daria begins to move this very movement the very moment this very movement gives a push to and actually clashes with the hollow emptiness the pokal this is kind of a pivotal paragraph actually it's expressing one of the root ideas jim yeah. Thank you. I, I was impressed by a difference uh, when Baba talked about the path as being real, capital R, whereas in his, in God Speaks and so on, the path is part of the illusion. Mm. Uh, so I wonder, could you comment on that? Uh, sometimes this language gets used in um, infinite intelligence also. Sometimes Baba will attribute reality to the uh, the planes the experience of the planes of consciousness and i think one shouldn't take that to mean that it's real with a real reality capital r reality but it's on the reality side of things it's coming into proximity and relationship to the reality it's starting to get overshadowed by the reality, so to speak. So he'll use that language sometimes. Again, if you're going to be rigorous about it, you don't get reality until the seventh plane. I don't think he's challenging that. Uh, so it's kind of reality. It's a greater reality than the gross world. Right. In that sense, it's an elevated reality, yeah. but it's not the reality quite no, yet. No, it's not the reality yet, but reality is starting to make its presence powerfully felt. You could put it okay. that way. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Baba will use that language sometimes. You know, Baba is using language to try to communicate truths <laughs> that are beyond language. So yeah. sometimes he'll set up a system of definitions and then violate them because that helps to express something and i think this is a case of that yeah yeah this diagram you know we it was kind of a puzzle at first uh, where all of a sudden this diagram comes in with the planes of consciousness and god unconscious and god conscious and i was thinking why is this here but it actually it's like his version of the end of the lecture. Instead of saying, create prem, he's saying, hey, boys, the only thing that matters between the unconsciousness that you originated in and um, conscious realization of God is the path to God. Forget about the rest of it. So it's a way of saying, create prem or enter the path or... Uh, Focus on the real. That's another version of the same theme, you might say. Cheryl. Quantum physics. There are actually particles. I don't know whether they're, I think they're neutrinos. And uh, they are potentialities. And mm. one is clockwise and one is counterclockwise. This is in physics right. it's been for a really long time. And then there are part, other particles with all kinds of strange names like quarks, and I can't remember all right, of them. Right. But um, it's very interesting that Pran and Akash are potentialities and these subatomic particles, which you cannot capture um, mm. in a moment of time. You, you can't get mm. to them um, because it's like if you attach, if you 
kind of nail them down. They don't, you can't nail them down. They're right. potentialities of either counterclockwise or clockwise um, energy or movement or, or something. But anyway, sorry. Spin. That's a, they talk about spin. spin. Yeah. That's right. It's counterclockwise and clockwise spin. Yeah. And hmm. they are potentialities. You know what that makes me think? It would be really good if, uh, you know, a high-powered scientist knowledgeable in this would really enter this discussion and study these things. But when I look at a lot of the quantum weirdness, what it makes me think is they're entering, trying to understand the domain of the imagination. Remember, thinking and imagination. So, when you get into the realm of the, and they're trying to unpack principles of the imagination itself. Um, so that when you think the imagination, you start to get into the domain of concrete reality, so to speak, the our re, you know, con, you know, false reality. But these things are in the realm of the imagination itself. And that's where the quantum weirdness starts to come into the story. Sure. I think they've I think they've been reaching that limit and trying to to pierce beyond that limit. Cheryl, mm. thank you. Sorry for the problem before. Um, so two questions, um, Ward. One is what reflection have you had on how the separate that's this is number one is the separation between prawn and akash happens what causes mm -hmm. that separation so that then they can come together or that baba says then they come together and yeah. Akash. what what causes the initial separation of prawn and akash yeah you see that baba hasn't given a cause here um i would think somehow all of this would have to be correlated and coordinated with the God Speaks um, narrative of uh, the whim of God um, arising. And there is a section, it would just be, uh, we'd really have to spend a long time reading it in the 10th state of God, um, where he talks about perspectiveness, the topic of perspectiveness um, that would be relevant to this. But um, here's a, another possible way of understanding this. Bob is trying to explain in concepts and words something that is really beyond the understanding. And um, maybe this would be the case, that the instant that Pranakash um, clash and the Jivatma uh, manifests and embodiment starts, as soon as that has happened, this prehistory is necessary. It has to have happened, right? That Pran and Akash separated. But since Pran and Akash are purely imaginary, that never happened at all. It's just that once you start to get thinking the imagination, it has to have happened, but it never did happen. See, if you understand the thought here, it's a necessary, <laughs> it's a necessary prehistory, but it never really happened. But once creation starts, it has to have happened. <laughs> did you That's have another question, Cheryl? Hmm. Yes, I do. I just want to write that down, but it never really happened. I just, sometimes I really hmm. want to capture something that's said. Okay, thank you. And then the second question is um, that uh, thinking the imagination, the imagination is hollow, it doesn't exist. And yet my question is, but it still has substance. I mean, I have now remember my, that imagination. Imagination is composed not just of Akash but of Pran too. Both of them are comprise the imagination. But you know, so there's okay. So I, I mean, this is a, a kindergarten question, but I still have tried to wrap my head around it before, and it's, today's session mm. has brought it up again. Um, mm. So there's substance. I mean. Even though I'm told a desk, I learned this a long, heard this a long time ago in like junior high school or before, desks are hollow. My body is hollow. It, it doesn't have substance. It's more air than anything else or space, space. But yet, you know, I can, the stupid 
little analogy of I can pinch myself and it hurts. There's some substance. They are not just physicality, but feeling, you know, reaction. How is that nothing? I understand on one level in a, a bit, but on another level, I just can't make the leap. Okay, one thing is uh, that nothing and emptiness are not the same thing here. Um, nothing and nothingness are the entire illusor, illusion, the entire imagination. But actually, the imagination is comprised of pran and akash. Pran is part of the uh, imagination also. So I think those ideas should be realize a difference. Nothing and uh, pokal or emptiness are separate from each other. But, you know, the substantiality you're talking about is the experience that happens once you start to think the imagination in that. Uh, you see, that's why it's useful to have a grapple of that idea. You've taken the imagination to be real. So the substance that you find in the imagination is actually something you've invested in it. It doesn't belong to the imagination itself. I'm sorry. I almost got it. And then my mind collapses into a million mm. keys on a typewriter. Could you just um, repeat that last line again, if you can? Or I can listen to it later, but say that again. Okay. The, uh, I mean, the word substance, we're using this word, which Baba really doesn't use, but yeah. the substantiality uh, that we experience is actually um, us investing our own reality in the imagination, which is not real at all. We're imputing it to that. And because we do it, we believe it to be real and we experience it and we're conscious of it. But actually the imagination doesn't exist at all. The reality is coming from us. Coming from us, you just said, which is this, our essential us, our real right. us. The real, the real are. self, yeah. The Atma. This is where thinking the imagination and infinite intelligence is really helpful, actually. It's a, well, I've, I've read it and I did a big seminar with you on it, but yeah, it, I know. at it's, the moment, it's a every, very, it's, every day it's very living, hard. I wish I could have more of a comprehension of the hollowness of things that it's all just my ima yeah. imagination i'm imagining whatever that would mm. be so helpful to me in terms of mm. we talk about you know baba talks about getting on the path mm. you, can't, you can't i can't do it until i actually have some ability to transcend my experience mm. of this false reality mm. thank you Chair. thank you Okay, I'm next. I have a comment. Uh, uh. Um, you had mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the Heisenberg principle mm. of uncertainty, which interestingly enough came out in 1927, the same year that right. Bob started right. his thoughts, right? <laughs> and that uncertainty principle identifies a particular kind of uncertainty, saying, what is it? You can't measure both the speed of an electron and its location. At the same yeah, time. Mo actually, it's the yeah. momentum. You, momentum. The momentum is related to speed. You can, the, mo the greater precision with which you um, specify the momentum, the less the precision with re regard to location and vice versa. And, and it occurs to me that that's a great analogy for what it's like to try to understand some of these concepts. I think there are <laughs> an unlimited number of Heisenberg like yeah. mm. so yeah. again this is this idea of shifting from one to another uh can break that mold and i'm thinking about when baba had us has us meditate he has us meditate mm. on his formful self and on the impersonal and alternate between those two mm. so i think that's yeah. the way that's the way this will grind itself out over the years for us yeah can I can I bring in a, a backstory on all of this? Uh, Jack, I have people with their hands up for a bit of a time now. So can, okay. can, we, can we get you to hang yeah. on? 
Okay. All right. Um, Marion, Marianne, sorry. I think Jim was before me. Jim has had a chance to ask several questions, so I like to let people who haven't asked their questions yet go first. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Ward, the um, John Shed's Eye that you explained mm. to us earlier helps me to um, wrap my head around the this concept of uh, the uh, uh, the real and the imagination, thinking and imagination, mm. thinking being yeah. real and imagination being not real. And mm. just the perception of Jamshed, you know, as the real, and then mm. it, it, bit by bit by bit, the, mm. um, um, the imagination takes form, you know, or is yeah, recognized. He realizes it more and more. Yeah, mm -hmm. he realizes it more and more. And um, so I just wanted to, to uh, thank you for using that, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that picture diagram because it helps me mm -hmm. to understand more what, what Baba is meaning by Pran and Akash under that mm -hmm. heading of imagination or, or um, mm -hmm. the false. Would that be false false? Well, where no, 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 that's in thinking. That's in thinking. When you when you take the imagination to be real, that's where the falseness comes in. Uh huh. But the imagination in and of itself doesn't exist. There's no question okay. of falseness. Yeah. All right. But you can see imagination. There has to be some principle of differentiation by means of which it can come up with the multiplicity of things. Right. Mm -hmm. You've got to have. Be, to create a diversity, you have to have a primordial uh, dichotomy at least. And that's where Prana Nakash comes into the story. It creates the multiplicity of forms within creation. And it's those forms that we realize and take to be real. And that's where our false consciousness comes. Mm -hmm. And I really liked your explanation of... Uh, Pran and Akash, that uh, Pran being movement, it needs some place to move in because right. the ocean mm -hmm. has no space, which right. I never really thought about like that. And so, mm -hmm. so movement is, um, uh, it has to have, it provides, um, Akash provides the, the ability for movement mm -hmm. to happen. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. An open. Okay. Um, one way I, th I think of it is it's an opening. If you uh -huh. have the sort of this impenetrable unity with no space or no time, it's like a closed system. And you have to have some kind of an opening in which happening can happen. Mm. And Akash is the opening. Mm. In that sense, Akash is potentiality. Um, in that way, it provides... Akash never does anything, but it provides the stage or the space in which happening can happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that, that infinite ocean is completely impenetrably closed mm -hmm. because there's no space there and there's no time there. Mm -hmm. How can anything happen when there's no space or time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why when you look at Prawn and Akash and imagination, you can right. say, nothing's happening <laughs> right mm -hmm. it isn't real. yeah that's right yeah so you have explained it really really well and i appreciate it thank you Mary. i mean this this dichotomy is very primordial the more you think of it the more movement and you see hollowness you see hollowness is pokal has that implication of hollowness it's sort of like uh not just space but wanting something to fill it hollowness seems to imply that doesn't it to you hollow you, mm -hmm. sort of you feel keenly the emptiness well it's hollow because it wants a kosh i wants prawn i want some prawn to happen yeah hollowness elicits prawn. right 
It's yeah. uh, very Buddhist in its concept of mm-hmm. dependent, things that are dependently co-arising. They cause each other to arise because they can't exist without the other. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So that's right. why when we talk about Pran and Akash separating originally, um, well, it's like that's, a, this is just me talking, but it's like that's the necessary story, right? That has to have happened. But if you're going to ask, when did it happen? I think the real answer is it never did happen because the imagination doesn't exist. But if you're going to take it to exist, as soon as you've done that, well, that's the, the, the what do you call a, a movie that goes back to the pre-story, you know? Um, prequel. You have the prequel. That's a necessary prequel. It has to be there or else you couldn't have had this happen. But if you're going to ask, when did the prequel happen? The real answer is it didn't happen because it doesn't exist. So that's one of these contradictions that you can crash your head on. And it's very good for the head to have to deal with things like that. So take your medicine. It's very good for you. Yeah. Jim, Jim Wilson, you waited long enough. Go ahead. Hey. Uh, in reflecting on our thinking about things, what came to mind uh, is that we are dealing with trying to say something exists and does not exist at the same time. Yeah, yeah that's and, right. Uh, this is a very hard concept for the West, mm-hmm. you know, because we, we want a real definite, something to be definitely uh, defined and limited and what have you. But I think in the East, when Baba was talking to his Mondali and stuff, it's a little bit more accepted, the idea that yeah. something could exist and not exist simultaneously, yeah. not unlike God is infinitely unconscious and infinitely conscious in one at the same moment. So, right. So yeah. it, it, it's a, it's something that's just mind boggling. And so yeah. we enjoy having our fun with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting that all of this stuff, this series of lectures and infinite intelligence um, got buried for a hundred years. Isn't that amazing thing? It's only coming out now. And to me, it makes perfect sense. The world at large and the West in particular would not have been capable of understanding this until now. But I think the West is reached a point where it can begin to understand these things. Yeah. And don't you think also the fact that Baba wrote God Speaks in English, a Western mm-hmm. language, uh, right. is his kind of turning toward us poor people in the West to give yeah. us some, some changes? Yeah, Baba chose English. I mean, he he had these great languages. He had Arabic he could have used, or Persian, or Sanskrit, or Urdu, or if he had wanted to hop yeah. over the Himalayas, Chinese, these magnificent ancient languages uh, with these tremendous vocabularies and this vast history of sublime understanding expressed in them. But I don't think he didn't, he wanted to start over, you know? He wanted to start from ground zero. And English is great for that. It's a very developed language, but there hasn't been great spiritual understanding in English, I would say. Great philosophical understanding, scientific understanding, great poets, but not high mystical understanding in English. So that was the, the right language for him to do that work in. Jack, did you have a question? You have to unmute. There you go. Uh, the interesting backstory for me in relationship to what we're talking about today um, has, to, has to do with uh, physics and uh, the fact also that Baba, Baba definitely said that science will come to an end of itself and it has to go into spirituality. And that's starting to happen. Mm-hmm. But in 1966, I had the opportunity to uh, knock on the door at Yeshiva University on the sixth floor. And I walked in and had a half hour discussion with Palm Dirac, who was the father of quantum mechanics. The room was dark. 
he was sitting at his desk, his back to a window with the blinds closed. And one of the one of the questions I asked him at that time, I'll never forget it, is what what are you doing? And uh, he gestured in his silhouette to the behind me, and there was a blackboard. And he said, I'm trying to figure out what it's all about. And it's interesting, in later years, uh, and due to the improved ability of humans and scientists, they were able to come to a point where they could look, look at, basically, through an electron microscope, developed much more than it was back then, where they seen stuff coming out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, still haven't figured out what that was all about. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because they say that a vacuum is an unstable state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, stuff yeah, is people... constantly appearing out of vacuums. Yeah. So when you see Baba's talk about nothing, it's a very uh, rich. Yeah, those are relates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm, yeah, definitely. So be before we get into a general discussion like that, I just want to check in one more time and make sure. Does anybody have any questions about the text that they need Ward to address at this point? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Well, I, I guess this is about the text. It's about and Akash. So I got the impression from what you and other people were saying is that this hollowness elicits, draws out. And I was trying to understand what the prawn or energy or movement mm. does as the complementarity or contrariety. If the Akash elicits by being a void and allowing for potentiality and for the space for something, what is it, what is that role or the doing that prawn is doing? Is it producing? Is it pushing out? What is the opposite or complementarity of eliciting? You know, Elizabeth, if you want to talk about that, we can talk about it later. It, it's a Buddhist concept. What I was driving as a Buddhist concept of they, they uh, independently co-arise. So they're independent, but they are co-arisen. And in that sense, they have to depend on one another. One cannot exist without the other. It's exactly the same as having opposites. Anyway, I didn't mean to take over the discussion there. Um, yeah, but I, I have thought about that too. Buddhism yeah. has the idea of pratitya samatpada, dependent yeah. arising. Uh, and this does make me think of that. They're necessary co-conditions of each other. Yeah. We did have a, uh, there was a, a fellow who after a discussion of this in Myrtle Beach went to a restaurant. He's a scientist and did experimental research. He had a, ordered uh, prawn and squash. <laughs> and so we wanted to know if they clashed and if it produced subtle gases, but he wouldn't tell us that. <laughs> well, I was thinking we forgot to get a joke from Jim before we start, so we'll let that one take its place. <laughs> so I'm going to stop the recording in a moment. Let's say the beloved's mm. prayer, and then we can mm -hmm. hang out and chat for a bit. How's that? All right. Feel free to unmute yourselves. And join me and Ward in saying the Beloved's Prayer. Beloved God, God help us help all, us all to, love to love you more and more, 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 and, more, more, more and more, and still yet more, so we become, become worthy of worthy worthy being with you. Help us all to help us all ask about the stomach. Till the very end. Till the very end. Thank you all. A wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you. I hope you got.